better, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, um, so this is like the approach into the show up the ramp. And then of course, like the first thing you see are the windows. And I wanted to just sort of walk up the span of windows and stop at the, um, the center, which is mm -hmm. the, like the center six windows, which is the kind of front of the Bentwood box. And oh, it's amazing um, to see it. Yeah, this is the first time you've actually seen the whole show. On yeah, video, I've, right? I've seen the um, time lapse, but not the not this way, like not seeing it this way. It's very beautiful. It is. It's yeah. really, it's really nice. It's and it changes from day to day. Yeah, that I love that dynamic, the shifts. Yeah. Yeah, even yeah, even from like each day because the slightly different position of the sun, and then each day depending on the clouds. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, last week we had some wildfire smoke, so that actually made oh. it so that there weren't there weren't shadows on the floor. Yeah. So that wow. added a whole other element. Yeah, I had done a work in um, an installation using boxes at the Museum of Anthropology maybe ten years ago, maybe more than that called one heat too high to be hidden and it basically the boxes rather than being carved on the outside were carved on the inside so when you approach them all you saw was black um, so you had to get close and then look in to see the, the the carvings on the inside the design work on the inside and then they were lit from the bottom but it was about um, access it was about a deliberate granting of access and limiting of access. And that element exists within this work as well. You know, the, some part of the dynamic of, of its shifts and changes is to not grant access 100% of the time. Um, right. Yeah, and that also has to do with the consumerism of kind of um, uh, neoliberal capitalism, right? Where everything is accessible for the right amount, right amount of money um, and everything is for sale. So, so this piece kind of denies access at times and, uh, and actually requests commitment on the part of the viewer um, to engage. So like uh, physically and visually. So it's not a one way relationship. It's uh, more dynamic than that, which is, which is what I think is um, needing in, in terms of our shifts in relationship to land and community. We, we have to change that dynamic of um, kind of a consumptive, consumerist, um, unilateral relationship to, to one of greater complexity. Um, if, if we only see the land as a resource, something to be extracted from, then the position that we end up within is the one we're in now, where the land is actually pushing back. And, and we see massive wildfires. We, we just are completely now in, engrossed in climate catastrophe uh, globally. Um, and that, that's what this work references in terms of like the, the visual reference to flooding, um, but also the sense of time when it, you know, like these shadows that, that come um, and then disappear um, and come back again. You know, that it's really deeply connected and tied into um, the light source of the sun and, um, and how that is in relationship to the planet. Yeah, uh, um, someone, one of the visitors, I've gotten a lot of really great information from and I, thoughts from some of the visitors and one mm -hmm. person came in and said, oh, what she's done here is basically built a giant sundial. <laughs> and that, that I thought that was funny yeah. and also pretty apt because it is um, it is kind of marking time in a way, like the, mm -hmm. the passage of time and um, the circulation of time. Yes, yes. And, and what's interesting about it is that it's so particular to um, Yale Union, you know, because it's very rare to to find a, a, a exhibition space such as this with so many windows and so much access, you know, in the, the division between the internal and the external interior space and exterior space is, is um, really something that Yale Union provides within its architecture. Um, so, the, so utilizing those windows in this way, um, 
really, really works for this piece. And, and also the engagement of kind of this post-industrial life of the building. Um, you know, how, right. how that itself has dynamically shifted and changed over time, right? Right, right. Um, one thing I wanted, I was hoping you could um, talk a little bit about too, and this is in relation to the windows, but maybe specifically these center six, which are the front of the box, which mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll be able to see them in the video, but um, they, yeah, this idea that like, um, we as like kind of, um, a culture are accustomed to the free visual access of the yes. of this um, of this symbology from your culture, yes. Yes. and um, and how you how you um, kind of play with that with um, with including this imagery in your work, making it central to your work. Yeah, the 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 concept of the box relates back to what I wrote about in my. Um, dissertation uh, in terms of a kind of a, a worldview of the clock, which kind of centers the body and space within the concept of a larger space, which is the family, and a larger space, which is the community, and then a larger space, which is the land. And it's all like deeply interconnected. Um, so we can't abstract ourselves from the land in the way that um, kind of um capitalism it requests that we do but it is also one of the concerns that we face today because of course what we're really being um you know what they're calling reconciliation in canada is really more uh kind of assimilation into canadian mainstream economy which means that you know we look at our forests and we look at our waters and we and we consider how we can extract from them in order to profit so that we can then fund our communities and the healing that needs to take place there which is really ass backwards mm -hmm. because really what we need in order to heal is access to our lands and territories so that we can maintain our spiritual relationship with those places and our connection in time deep time to those spaces so where i come from and where i've just come out of literally yesterday my home community um you know, we have a connection, deep connection to our lands and territories that goes back thousands of years, literally thousands of years, thousands of years of living in the same place and building on that relationship, generation after generation after generation. And what is the value of that? And that's the alternative economy that I'm trying to present uh, in terms of, say, what we would call a feasting economy. Uh, an economy that's based on a relationship with land and a relationship with one another, and then looks at that relationship in terms of how it provides for us as human beings. And what do we provide back then, which is not an equation that you find uh, under current kind of capitalist economic paradigms. The, the visual imagery in the on the windows is literally um, a rendering of what we would consider to be say the undersea world so the undersea world then is conceived of as this like almost like a if we consider uh, our body to be a box and the house we live in to be a box and then the land we live in to be an, a larger box then that box shows this uh, elements of this undersea world, which were kind of more or less kind of engaging with more and more as the ocean demands that we pay more attention to what's happening within it. Um, so that the, the box is kind of broken open so that the end panels, the two end panels on each of the 22 uh, foot wall have the ends of the box um, imagery. So if you look at a traditional Pacific Northwest Coast box, it'll have a large facial image in the large central panel. And then the two sides will be painted with certain types of imagery. And so that's what's on the two ends. On each of the two ends are the ends of the box. So literally the box is broken open. And then you see all the elements of these different creatures who are embroiled in, uh, I guess what you might would call it a kind of like a flooded exploded open 
kind of water world, um, which is actually what we're, we're, we're kind of experiencing that now in a metaphoric sense um, in relationship to what's happening with the land um, uh, and, and us as nations. So within those images as well are pictured specific there are specific symbols that refer to specific countries. And most of those um, countries referred to are the wealthy countries, the, the countries who have benefited from development and um, exploitation of other countries and other lands uh, in order to become wealthy. Canada is one of them, United States is one of them. So there are images of those countries um, referenced through their like national, national animals. Uh, and national symbols because all kind of, all modern countries have uh, national symbols. So those national symbols appear in this kind of waterscape um, of the uh, uh, the underworld, I guess you would say, of the Kwakwakiwak, which is pictured um, in in the in the in the imagery, the linear imagery of the blue windows. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to walk over here so we can see this piece and then um, I wanted I was hoping you could maybe say more about um, the idea of the potlatch and um, and this sort of um, anti-capitalist economy that it um, renders yeah so so potlatch is a more of a modern word it's Chinook jargon and it was used kind of as a pan cross cultural word. Uh, referring kind of more or less to our um, the main kind of expression of our social relationships with one another. Um, so I I would say like uh, you know even potlatch is a is a limiting word in that it tries to kind of modernize what what that actually was. So for us, we have several words that, that could be called potlatch, like pasa. Pasa is a very interesting word because it refers to the flattening of baskets. So it talks about how you fill your baskets. And then when you give away to the people, when you feed them, when you're generous with, with what you have access to, the, the baskets are flattened, <laughs> they're emptied. And that's what we call pasa, and it's a certain type of potlatch, a certain type of giveaway. But the basic, most fundamental um, ceremony that we have is the feasting. The feasting. The feasting is you you provide for the people, you invite them in, and then you you give away to them, uh, particularly food. And anyone can feast. You don't have to be a big chief. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to. You know, anyone can give a feast, and that's where that's the basic foundation of our culture: is to give away, not to hoard, not to accumulate to oneself. In fact, that's considered shameful. You collect so that you can give it away. So there's a, a relationship of return, and that is the fundamental principle as well behind our relationships to one another as well as our relationship to the land. So we do not just extract from the land, we give back to the land. And, and in many ways, our ways of giving back to the land, A, was to take care of the land, to steward it, to make sure that it maintained itself as healthy, but also to have a spiritual relationship with that place because we also saw spirituality as having value and a, a sense of nourishment, not just for the land, but for peoples as well. So this image is of my, um, my uh, great, great grandmother's brother. And his name was Jim Hamzid, which is an interesting name because it literally refers to feeding. Hamzid refers to feeding, you know, someone who feeds the people. Um, and he's standing by this giant feast, feast dish in Kingham. And the feast dishes used to be very prevalent amongst the Kwakwakiwak, um, but most of them now exist in museums because they were removed. Our economy, our internal economy was destroyed through colonialism and these feast dishes were removed and put into uh, museum institutions. So you'll see one in Portland, in the Portland Art Museum and that Kwakwakiwak feast dish, this gigantic feast dish of what we call Zunukwa, 
And this too is a Junoqua. Um, it's a different dish from the one that's in the Portland Art Museum, but um, in the, it has the same monumentality. And in its monumentality, you know it is important. It is a very important symbol for the Kwakwakiwa. And what I was getting at was um, basically like the importance of feasting, the, the fundamental importance of our own economy and our ways of relating to one another, which are reciprocal. It's not unilateral, it's reciprocal. And that's the bowls that are all laid out on the floor, then literally refer to, um, you know, in the past when we used to um, um, host, uh, uh, I guess what you call polage, then the things that were given away. So you didn't just feed the people, you also gave away things and uh, practical things like these, this type of bowl. So a hundred years ago, this type of bowl would have been put on display outside of the the, the big house, which was going to be turned into a ceremonial house for the potlatch. And at the end of the potlatch, after all the witnessing had been done um, and the feeding and the dancing, then the things that had been brought by the family would then be given away to the witnesses, the ones who had come to bear witness to um, the, the potlatching. And so things like, or like these bowls would be given away and that's why they're out there and they're arranged in that way and and it also has a certain kind of symbolic reference to accounting inventory but it's very different from what we experience in under modern capitalism in terms of uh, inventory and kind of profitability and sales so it's, it's completely different worldview but the similar but an object that occupies space uh, and, and a similar space, but a very but coming out of a very different principle. So that's why those those are there. This kind of um, reference to pot latching, and um, and then of course the feast dish that you see in the background and and Jim Humsey. Um, and we had also talked about at one point about the um, the bowls symbolizing feasting and gathering and eating together as being kind of doubly symbolic now during the pandemic, because that's something that we can't do. I mean, that's the reason why you can't be here to do this walkthrough. Yeah. And because we can't be together, we can't travel and gather. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something about their emptiness too, which um, kind of, which adds to Mm -hmm. the um, the symbolism of, of this time, of making this show at this time. And it is interesting too, because like even referring to the title of the exhibit, uh, a, feast of, a Feast of Light and Shadows, well, who are the guests? <laughs> I actually think the guests are the windows. The images in the windows are animated and they become the guests of this feast, this symbolic feast. And they... They, they are present and then they are absent. They come, they witness, and then they leave on the basis of the relationship to the sun. So it has this, this incredible poignancy about it, poetry about it. Um, uh, and it, that's also why we placed the images um, on the far end, the photographs on the far end, because... <laughs> They, they then provide a literal anchor point um, that tie back to, you know, the physicality of the generations who have maintained and kept alive this way of thinking. Um, it's certainly something that I consider myself to be um, an, an inheritor of. My family, um, my uncle Ernie in particular, um, really tried to, to teach me when I was young, uh, this philosophy, this way of life. Um, and uh, I didn't always understand it. And I, and I still struggle to understand it at times because the modern world does not embrace this way of thinking. And yet the truth is that without embracing or coming to learn or have a relationship with this different way of thinking, we are not going to survive the catastrophe ahead of us. So these images show um, certain 
snippets of specific time periods. So my grandfather's brother is in the center of this photograph, um, and which is a kind of a companion piece to the, the photograph of Jim Humsey. And all of those men can be named who are in those images, who, who are in that image, and their descendants are the ones that live in Kinkum today, um, their grandchildren, their children, their grandchildren, and their great grand. And this one shows a uh, potlatch in Alert Bay about a hundred years ago. And you can see how the bowls are lined up and the giveaway. You can see how much effort was put into the giveaway, what they call yakwa, what will be given away. Um, it was spectacular, it was spectacular. And so opposite of the hoarding that we see under neoliberal capitalism. And also, you pointed out to me before that these images of the potlatch were um, taken during the potlatch ban when it was illegal to yes, do this. When it was illegal to do this. So, the resilience of our people to hold on to this has been absolutely remarkable. And it's something, it's something that I currently am engaged in right now. I, I am trying to, to help us to hold on to this because. Right now, the indoctrination into neoliberal capitalism of indigenous peoples is actively being um, promoted. You know, that this is, that is the solution that the colonial governments are putting forward for indigenous peoples. It's not that they want to engage with indigenous principles and change. It's that they want indigenous peoples to come on board with what they're doing. And it, that's a death sentence for us as a people and the land. And then this last one is the, this is the feast dish that's across the river at the Portland Art Museum. Yeah, I really wanted to spatially create a connection between, you know, what I'm talking about that seems to come from up north to be in a ge different ge geographic. And yet I think that what I'm talking about has every relevance to what's going on all along the coast. And this feast dish in particular was taken um, out of the Kwakwakwak territories and has somehow ended up in the Portland Art Museum. But, but my thoughts around it are what, 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 what were the economic conditions that created that exodus? What created that exodus of material wealth um, that is now no longer in the communities but in colonial institutions all around the world? Uh, that's a relationship that I think we need to question. Right, and that relates to um, the whole economy of, of the whole art economy um, that this is now, you know, this is colonial plunder that's now looked at as art in the art museum and is like their prize um, piece in their collection of Northwest Native art. Yeah, and in a way it also then relates back to the shadows because really at the end of the day, what does the exhibit <laughs> and how accessible is it? you know, like as a physical, you know, the desire to project or own the physicality of other nations, other cultures uh, on the part of colonialism it is, it is a fact. Um, and in order to avoid that uh, fetishization, you know, the, the, the work, the fundamental aspects of this work are shadows that they cannot be owned, they cannot be bought or purchased they're deeply integrated to the natural process of the sun and the and the and the daily span um so there's a form of resistance there happening as well and it formally right so rather yeah. than you know it's interesting because originally i think we had talked about having the feast dish in the in the space um but in mm -hmm. a way when i think about it now i think this is the right way to have gone about this exhibit because the feast is very difficult it becomes very difficult then not to fetishize the feast dish and it's absent. It's only there because of light, right? Photogra photography is, is a process of, of a relationship with light. So the photograph shows us the feast dish. But really, this is an, is an exhibit of light. It is. And as, we, um, as the sun gets low in the evening, the shadows of the figures get more and more distorted, um, which is another way that they're sort of like, um, resisting being seen. Yeah, yeah. Mm 
yeah, even I had to resist making them more solid and, and to say, no, it, it's a, you can see the images solid, solid lines on the glass, you know, but rather than to fetishize the shadows and make them completely accessible as visual forms on the floor, it was this kind of embrace of the, the more ephemeral aspects of distortion, you know, disappearance, emergence, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on while we're here? No, I don't think so. I, th I think we covered quite a bit of ground, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we will um, talk soon. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, bye, Marianne. Bye-bye.